So you can pretty much guarantee the suburban area is your counties of Cook, DuPage, Will, Kane, into Kendall, okay, that you will have the LL student in your classroom. Okay? Oh my gosh, what do I do? <coughs> Who's having an experience with a one or two year old? Who's the other little kid? Okay. How do they learn a language? How does a child in an English home learn language? Give me some ideas. They just pick it up from what they hear. Okay, from what they hear. Other ideas. Interactions with other kids that are also learning language. Okay. Movies they watch. Movies they watch. Okay. From the caregiver. Okay, from the caregiver. Um, a lot of times they say if it's a second language in the home, you might have someone who speaks English and uh, as a caregiver. <coughs> what the thesaurus says is language acquisition is done by mimicry or mimicking. And the thesaurus says that mimic means to copy imitate, to parrot, to reflect, to repeat, to echo, or to impersonate. That is how <coughs> kids learn a language, little ones learn a language. When you're teaching a student who does not have an English background, this is they learn their language the same way. They mimic you, they parrot you, they imitate you. Okay? So it is imperative that you as a role model do a good job being a role model. The six pages of language acquisition, you do have a paper, most of you do you have um, it, uh, most of you it's white, some of you it was yellow. Um, there's a listing of the six stages of second language acquisition and, and I think one of your earlier session presenters talked about it. This is for your benefit, this is for your resource. And we also will be using it when we do our activity. On the back side of it, you have teaching strategies for students that are determined to be in pre-production age or um, stage or the speech emerging age. So keep this um, you know, handy, file it away, put it in your three ring binder. So when you do get a second language learner in your classroom, you have some tips on how to deal with them. Silent pre-production age <coughs> is where a child, if you think about this, a one or a two-year-old, not quite talking yet, they do a lot of observing, observing and a lot of listening. In early production, they start using short words, phrases, they have a lot of errors, but they're starting to speak a little bit more. You have your speech immersion stage where your vocabulary increases and you've got a lot more social <coughs> This is the stage where if you have a child, don't do their talking for them. Make them ask you. If they point at something, say, what would you like? Would you like the milk? Tell me you want the milk. Oral production is very important in language acquisition. Beginning fluency is the next stage. It's, it's where the student is struggling because they don't have that word. They can't think of the vocabulary word that they need in English. They might know it in their first language, but they don't know the vocabulary word that they're looking for. Intermediate fluency, you have less errors, and, but you still have some gaps in your academic vocabulary. Advanced fluency is where they start to be comfortable communicating with, um, communicating with you as a teacher and in the educational setting. Okay. Think about this. It takes five to seven years to reach fluency. So if a student comes to you in kindergarten, they will not be fluent in English until they are in the fifth grade. If they come to you in fourth grade, they will not be fluent or as fluent as their peers are until the tenth grade. If they come to you in seventh grade, it will take them almost to senior year before they become fluent, as fluent as their peers. Okay? You have to remember, it's not going to happen overnight. Especially you're talking high schoolers who have to learn the academic chemistry, biology, geometry, world cultures, learning the academic language as well as English at the same time. The 
be, think about um, students in what is it, third, third grade start taking the ISAF, right? Students in high school have to take the PSAEs. So here you have a student in third or fourth grade who's only been in the country <coughs> for say, two years or in an English environmental situation, um, educational environment. They're in third grade. They now are learning English, trying to learn academics, and are getting assessed by the Illinois State Achievement Test. <coughs> so these, these kids are getting it from all sides. Okay, there are some modified test forms for ELL students, but after having been with us for a little bit, it's not very different. It's the temper. If you ever get it, it's not very different than this. <coughs> hey, um, some of your handouts, just to go, we will be using these when we do our activity. Most of you have a yellow, I think it's yellow. This one, it's got the um, numbers on the side. It has the numerical rankings for entering, beginning, developing, okay? Uh, your other one, this, what this does is it tells you um, what a, an ELL student will understand or produce in an academic <coughs> setting. Okay, so we're going to be using these numerical system. And it corresponds to that first white sheet that we gave you, so these two correspond. You also have a green can do. This comes from the WIDA. Um, English language learning standards and this is the kind of the approach I would like you to take today is we are going to focus on what the student can do not what the student cannot do okay so as we go through our activities you will see a lot of these um, statements listed up on our uh, big post-its so our first activity we're going to separate by station um, and we are going to be focusing on the language domain. So if, and don't move until I explain what we're doing here. If you have a pink card, you will be going to the pink corner. If you have a green card, you'll be going to the green section back there. If you have a blue card, you'll be going to the blue section back there. If you have a yellow card, you'll be going up here into this corner. What we will be doing is... <coughs> I want you to kind of discuss with your group and talk about the language domain. So the pink, you're going to be talking about listening. So you will be dealing with the um, listening aspect of the we at can do's. Okay, green is speaking, blue is reading, and yellow is writing. So the four language domains that the student will be assessed in and that you need to teach. Okay. Um, so back in, let's see here. I want to get some ideas on what you would do as an instructor. Let's say you're in the speaking room. What would you do to get your child speaking, and how would you assess that child? So you're going to use just the one um, big post back there. The other ones are for another activity. So think about this. Discuss with your group. Go into your group. There's uh, markers here. Grab a marker. Take it to your group. Um, and think about things that you would do as a teacher. How would you get your kids listening and how would you assess their listening abilities and speaking and reading and writing? And um, we'll give about five minutes and then we'll share. Okay, so go ahead and split up into your groups. You're welcome to go sit down again if you'd like or you can stand, it doesn't matter. Um, okay, let's take a look and let's see what the pink group, what did they come up with as far as suggestions for educating and assessing ELL students in listening, in the domain of listening. Okay, so um, sometimes they got to accept their instructions and they use pictures and objects, or they read tests and assessments um, as one of the questions. Okay, in the language domain of speaking, what did you guys come up with? Uh, we will ask the right questions just by right here. Kind of hard for us to see because it is kind of below the quote right there. What did you guys come up with? Um, for reading, we did books on tape, visual aids, um, picture books, that, and then we have them tell the story in, in English. 
and then a reading with a partner, flashcards, and pay language slash English, playable classroom, and also white bilingual books. And for testing, we are going to test on comprehension, fluency, vocabulary, phonics, text comprehension, and relation to text. Oh, we don't want to be in her class. Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> very, very good suggestions. Let's go over here to writing, the language domain of writing. Oh, we said we would use labels in the classroom. Um, so they would have a visual representation of the words. And we could also have, for younger children, a chart with a picture of an action with a label that went under it so that they could point to what action they wanted to, like get a drink. Uh, we could also make lists and have them copy words that they see to see how their handwriting is and how they form it. We also have different alphabets in the classroom. And then uh, for assessments, we could also use spelling tests. Okay. And then we self-correct these sort of things. And also, uh, if you say something, you can write it down on the board or whatever, so they have a visual representation of what they say. Excellent idea. What's our thread through all of these? What word, what one word are we seeing in all of these? Pictures. 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 Visual representation of what you want a child to learn. You cannot stand up in front of the class and tell the student that you want to learn about photosynthesis and the processes of plant growing when the child doesn't even know what you're talking about. When you say flower or plant, they made the suggestion, one of these, about using the native language. Using, and there are products out there in the market where you have a picture, say of a flower, and in Spanish you can get flora and flower. So that now they're getting visual representation, native language representation, and English. Labeling things in your classroom. Door, window, TV, overhead, wall, coat hanger, desk, chair. That way they see these terms over and over and over again. That's how you learn language. So our thread through all of this was basically, oh, heavens. Can um, the common thread again was pictures, visuals, and using a lot of oral language. All right. So we don't, and some of you had, I don't know if both session ones talked about the WIDA, the world, world class instructional design uh, consortium. Um, they come out with these books that are broken down into um, grade level, language domain, <coughs> ability level, so you've got your pre-production and your silent phases and things like that, and all the things that a teacher can do. The original one comes in college. But it tells you how to deal with the classroom and with the academics. It has academics of social studies, the academics of math, the academics of science. So now you have this poor little fourth grader who's got to learn vocabulary and science, math, <coughs> social studies, the social aspect of the classroom, rules, things like that. All within one school year. Okay, so keep this in mind. Language production, oral production is very, very important for a student to learn. Um, Says learning occurs when the activity is active, motivational, meaningful, pleasurable experience, multi-sensory, and the personal connection is fun to the for the student. Their emotions are engaged, and it's in a low anxiety setting. So we're going to do. We can take a break. Should we take a break, or should we just keep on moving? Keep going. <laughs> keep, going. keep going. Okay. Our second activity, um, and then we'll actually be done pretty much after the second activity. Um, if you're going to kind of shift around now here, if you are interested in pre-K, K, educational, early childhood, you will be in this corner in the pink corner, okay? If you are a first grade, second grade interest, because I know nobody knows exactly what they're going to be teaching, but if that's your interest, go to the green group. If you are 
in the third, fourth grade level in elementary school, um, go to the blue level. And if you are fifth grader up, that'd be middle school, high school, um, go to the yellow section. Okay? And I will demonstrate what we will do. How many friends? Surprise, surprise. He's not. But it's totally gone. I knew it was. Yes. Yeah. So Okay. All, all of you will, will be breaking into smaller groups, and all of you will get a literature book okay. and a puppet. Right. Some of you have non-fiction books, because I will just distribute the envelope. Some of you have non-fiction books, so you will actually be talking about non-fiction, realistic everyday life things using a puppet. Okay? And this, as you can tell, is very easy to make. Um, and what you're going to be doing is kind of doing a little lesson. You and the partner of yours, one of you are going to be the teacher, one will be the ESL student. Okay? Let me ask you this. How would you start? If you needed to review this book, what would be the first thing that you would do? I brought it along. What's the first thing? Ask them what they know about frogs. Okay, ask them what they know about frogs. That would be a good idea. Maybe if you knew you were going to do this text, you would um, find out in their native language what frog and lock, how it's pronounced or how it's written in their native language. Okay, now we're getting a little more personal, right? It has to be a personal connection, as it said. Okay? Um, I, as a teacher now, because we're going to work on oral language, I would read through the book. You could do some picture walks, say, oh, look at my little frog, jumping around, got his athletic work on, he's got his sweatbands, going for a job, okay, he needs his friend, the puppy, he's got some cold outs, things like that. So we would look through the book, right? And then um, we would read through the book. And maybe my student has the frog, okay? And there is some verbalization here in this book by the frog. So we'll just take this page here. It says, next day it is sunny. Bump into my log, says frog. Bump into my log, says frog. Okay, now we're getting oral production and we're getting reading, right? They might not be able to read the words depending on how this is a first or second grade book but they can repeat, right? Okay. Is frog trying to be funny? Bump your log, barks up the dog. And it says, no, bump away, croaks grinning frog. No, bump away, croaks grinning frog. Okay, so now we've got frog, we've got log, we've got grinning, the term grinning, okay, which is emotional, okay? So what you guys are going to do is just kind of play around with this for a little bit, you and your student. Thank you for helping me. There are UK and UK literature books used as you can expect from many people. So you might need to go in and like these are fours or fives or whatever. And your friends can see that over there. Okay? I came up with four vocabulary words that we're going to work on. Because this is a kind of a phonics book, my words are frog, log, bog. People know what a bog is. And the last page of this book, it says, frog is a bog. Okay, not a term we use every day. Okay, but now we have a phonics lesson going here. All right, we can put these on flashcards or whatever with a little picture on the back of it so that the child can remember what a bog is. I'm not sure anybody in our classes nowadays would know what a bog is or the word bog. Now we're going to write. We've done our visual, we've done our listening, we've done our speaking, responding back in the, uh, while you're reading, and now we're going to write. So you can write a sentence, and your suggestion was either um, 
have the child give you a sentence and you write it if they're at that level. If they're at the level where they can write a sentence, go right ahead and have the child write it. But just come up with a couple vocabulary, two, three words from each of the books and give us a little quick sentence. Okay, using your vocabulary words. Let's go with rainbow. Joe, and there's Joe. Okay. 
Okay, and these, all they did was scan a picture from the cover of the book um, and cut it out and put it on a popsicle stick. And there's your activity, right? Very easy. Um, what do we have back here for who had the beach and the sand in the shovel? Ours was the Blue's Clues characters and they're at the beach. Okay, Blue's Clues. Hold up Blue and a friend. There we go. Okay. Um, and your words were? Beach, sand, shovel, pail, and castle. Okay, and what was your sentence? They built the sand castle with the shovel and pail at the beach. Our second one. Oh, shark. We had a shark in the park. Shark in the park, and our characters were? Puff and the one. Okay. Yeah. All right. What was your vocabulary word? Okay. And your sentence? The dog stopped shark in the park. Okay. And as you can see, like fox, you'll see the other one too. My frog on the log, shark in the park. We have where was my other one? These are phonetic little readers. Okay. Who else do we have here? Oh, there, Fox. Oh, you had the very, oh, yes, kids like this one. And what were our characters? We had the web and the spider. Okay, and your vocabulary? Busy uh, web, walking spider. Okay, and your sentences? The spider is very busy, spider is the web. Okay. And other animals want to spider is the spider. Okay, so we get our visual and our auditory and our vocabulary words and our reading and our speaking. We have some one more. Oh, okay. And then the words that we mostly use is what we call that part of vocabulary, mm -hmm. which is box, box, and hungry. Okay. And we're on the cover page, so those two can help when you get close to the next one. And then the hungry box is on the box. Okay, so we got um, and box on the box is another one of those phonetic um, readers. We have sharp and fox and frog. Okay, excellent. Moving along. Over here we have, what's our book? A Rainbow of My Own. A Rainbow of My Own, and our characters were the little boy and his rainbow. Okay, and your, oh, there's a good vocabulary word for you. You have <coughs> rainbow and excavators. That's, that's oh, that's 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 oh, that was yours. Okay. Oh, that's right. You guys got the. Um, and what is your sentence for rainbow? Today I saw a rainbow. Okay, so very simple. I went to the Walmart and got this piece of material that looks like a rainbow so that the children could then can make their own rainbow with the little boy in his raincoat. You guys had? We had Dig at Work, and our characters were Pig and Wolf. Okay. And our vocab word was excavators, and our sentence is I dug up dirt with the excavator. Okay, that's, that's a pretty big word for third and fourth grade. Um, but that's, that's almost getting closer to a nonfiction book because now you're talking about a real world situation there, although they're still using characters. Fifth grade and up, we have baby bears. Okay. We have the mama bear and the two baby bears. Okay. Our words are, our vocabulary words are? Brave, bear, camera, and photographer. Okay, and our sentence? Some photographers have come to near the bears, snapping pictures. Okay, so this is a, um, a nonfiction, realistic book, but you can do the same idea of to get that oral production out of a student and being able to read. Now we're doing a kind of a science unit also. Mm -hmm. um, there was also Bear in Mind. Bear in Mind, which is bear poems. So now we're getting a different aspect of. Um, oral production in poem form. Okay, and that had a character with him too, right? Do you have a bear? Oh, okay. Maybe this one. Oh, maybe this one. Is okay. Yeah, there it is. Okay. But now we're experiencing poems about bears. So you've got a, basically a science unit and a language arts unit all on the subject of bears. And that's the purpose of this. The purpose of this was to show you that it is not hard to get children, all of your students, including your ELL students, to work on listening, speaking, reading, and writing production. Again, remember that you are the role model. 
You have to use correct <coughs> pronunciation. You have to use clear enunciation. You have to use crisp articulation when you want someone to speak correctly. And please, 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 this is my biggest pet peeve. Do not use terms like woulda, shoulda, coulda, wanna, have to. Because you can't, and I just said this, this was, Okay, now, working with another, another teacher. Oh, I was in a conference. <laughs> working with another a, a teacher who teaches sixth and seventh grade. She was complaining because the kids were always writing on their essays, cuz, C U Z, cuz, cuz. Why can't they just say because? Well, because it's not because, it's because. You want them to spell because, say because. Don't say because, you know. And now they're the big thing now. Everybody's doing the, you know, the, all the texting, oh my gee, and LOL, and all of that stuff, and it's driving the teachers nuts. So be prepared when your students are doing their essays using text language. Okay. Again, if you want them, you have to teach them what you want them to reflect back to you. If you want them to learn how to spell shoulda, coulda, and woulda, then go ahead and put those on your spelling list and have to make sure they spell them correctly. But again, that is not what they're trying to say. They are trying to say, we should of. And believe me, they get very confused on the ISATs and on all their assessments when they see the word, um, they, don't, they say have or have to. And they're not used to seeing have to. They're used to seeing have to or saying have to. We have to go to the store. Okay? So it's something to keep again in the back of your mind. So, what did we do? We focused on oral language as much as possible at the level that the student is capable of speaking. So, even if it's that oral reading, repetition, you know, back to you. You need to understand and assess what the student can do, not what they can't do. Okay? And use fun and comfortable activities for language development. Um, some of you have other handouts. You have a blue handout, just so that you know. This is just a pick this up uh, on my book. It's just a, a listing of graphic organizers that you can use, which is a, an excellent visual tool for ELL students. Some of you have gotten the pink sheet, which is a list of um, very good ELL websites. Kind of put this in your book of tricks. Keep it handy. So if you do have an ELL student in your classroom, you do have some excellent resources, web resources. If you want to add these to um, your the website page, uh, Jeanette Gordon, who is from the um, Illinois Resource Center, has an excellent page that links to everything ESL. This is her website. Um, this is another ESL uh, website, Teacher Ideas. And then this is my email address. If you ever want to contact me for any reason, um, you're more than welcome to. I'm here to help. Um, just real quick, another idea to go along with this. These are some, I'm going to get these two for a dollar at Dollar General. These are excellent books to make puppets out of. They're just big coloring books where the student could cut it out, color it, make up their own little story, write their own little story. These things, these books were two for a dollar. Here we've got some kind of animal caricatures. This one's got a, a fox. This one's got, got a roller skating guy. But this is, again, where they could start making up their own little stories. Little Bunny went to play baseball. He hit a home run. You're getting your writing production, your reading production, your speaking, and your listening. Because now they have to can share. <coughs> but do, resources are not expensive. They don't have to be expensive for teachers. Um, and what I did is I made it. The child wants to say with Shark in the Park, wants to do another character, give him a blank. Give him a blank card, not a popsicle stick, and let him draw his own character. 
or characters or leave these in their center area. Make up your own characters. Okay? <coughs> you're, getting, you're getting them talking with his friend. You do a little girl, I'll do a little girl. We'll talk back and forth. Okay? Again, language production. Language, they can't acquire language unless they use language. Any questions on anything that we've covered today? Um, thank you. Uh, again, my website, I'll put it back up here. Um, if you, anybody needs any information, any resources, things like that, I mean books and books and books and books for ESL. Please um, continue your education in ELL. Get your endorsement or your approval if you can. Um, I think Ms. Dixon is going to talk about how you can do that. They don't offer it here at yeah, Jaw. Well, you can talk about it. Okay, okay so I'm it. not an expert on the yeah, IRC, but it. the Illinois Resource Center, which is now up in Arlington Heights, anybody know where that? Mm -hmm. Okay, offers the classes. It's 18 hours of graduate class, and then you can get certified, approved, endorsed, whatever term you want to use, as an ELL teacher. You will be so marketable if you have that endorsement. Those who are doing junior high, you have to get a junior high endorsement or something for different, um, if you're going into reading or uh, history or something like that. It's basically the same thing. You have to take 18 hours of college credit in these courses listed. Um, Mrs. Dixon said that U of I offers a lot of these classes online. So you can take some of these classes to get certified. This is just a, you, you, it's just another trick to add to your bag if you want to get hired. If I'm certified in the and now PSL and I come out of EIU with an elementary degree and you come out of EIU with an elementary degree, who do you think is going to get hired? Okay? You have to be marketable. You want to you know, teaching jobs are, because districts have to keep cutting back, they're going to go for someone who has more um, endorsements or whatever you want to call it. If you get your reading endorsement, get your social studies endorsement, get your math endorsement. If you go to a district, I was very fortunate. I went to Mattoon when I got hired as a PLL teacher because I'm so old. They told me I had to come back for a middle school endorsement to teach 6th and 7th grade. So I started taking 6th and 7th grade middle school endorsement classes here, and then just continued on to get a second master's degree in reading um, and with those middle school endorsements. Um, but you're just so much more remarkable. <coughs> so much more valuable to a district if you can be, if you can do more than just teach second grade. Okay. Good luck to you guys.